Okay, I might as well read this now before um, I read the uh, psalm. Let me get the psalm ready, and I'm going to read you something. Just, you know, uh, it, it has to be a person that watches the, um, uh, it has to be somebody that watches the sermons, just by the terminology. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, um, but I got a, a letter in the mail, and, you know, this is the kind of thing that just blesses me. This person wrote once before, and they wrote once again, and I want to include this in the sermon to let um, them know, because I do think that they watch the sermons as well as the prophecy updates. Um, thank you for your work and sharing your insight into the Lord's Word. That's why I think they watch the sermons. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Um, I, I, this is kind of, I, I hate to even say it because it makes me look good, and I'm not, but it says you're a, certainly a sharpened tool of God. Anyway, and then uh, a, a short note after that, and I don't want to give their names because uh, the name of the wife is so different that, you know, they, you, if they, somebody was watching, they would know who this person is because it's such a beautiful name. It's, I've never heard it anywhere before, but when I walk into the doors and I see that on the floor, it just lightens my heart. You know, we're a small congregation, and yet we have these people around the states that watch online or maybe streaming or, or I don't know what, but uh, that's all they said. They haven't asked, you know, like, you know, we want to be your best friend or anything, nothing like that. Just gracious words, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and first uh, read Psalm number 47 today, which is to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves. Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together. The people of God, the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Our sermon today is Exodus 12. It's verses 12 through 20. It's entitled, Saved Unto Holiness. So this is uh, Exodus 12, starting in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the uh, seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. Verse 17, so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that per same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. One final plague is coming upon Egypt before the Israelites will be released from their bondage. However, this plague will be unlike anything which has ever occurred before, both in type and in magnitude. It will strike at the heart of every family in Egypt. The Lord will pass through the land and selectively kill all of the firstborn males of Pharaoh himself, all the way down to the female servant who is behind the handmill. He will also kill the firstborn of every animal. However, there is a notable difference in this plague in another way as well. In the previous plagues, a distinction was made, either implicitly or explicitly, between the Egyptians and Israel. They didn't need to do anything to be exempt. They simply were. But in the case of this plague, they need to do something. 
They need to provide a sign or they too will be struck by the plague. Now, why was this necessary? The Lord already showed from the previous plagues that he could tell the difference between the people and more, the people already had a sign. They had circumcision. Why wasn't this sign acceptable instead of killing an animal and spreading its blood on the doorway of the houses? The answer is that circumcision of the flesh only brought them into covenant relationship with the people of Israel as a collective whole. It is what designated them as a people group. However, it was not a sign of faith from the individual. Rather, it was a mark placed upon them before they knew to do right or wrong. Throughout all of the dispensations in the Bible, the means of salvation remains the same. Always, it is salvation by grace through faith. A person could simply have refused to follow the instructions of the Passover, and they too would have suffered the punishment of losing their firstborn. Paul shows in Romans that being circumcised does not save anyone. There needs to be a conversion of the heart, or the circumcision of the flesh means nothing. Without faith in God's provision, every external sign and deed in the world won't get a person one step closer to being saved. And yet, there's more. Being redeemed implies a cost. The concept of redemption includes or indicates a purchase is made to buy something back. In essence, there is a clearing of a debt. The blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintel showed that a price had been paid. A substitute had died in the place of those inside the house. Today, we will see what comes after being saved. There is a responsibility that goes along with it. If it isn't acted on, then there are consequences for that failure to act. These stories and the minute details that they contain show pictures of greater things, things to come in Christ. Are you saved? Have you called out to Christ and accepted his death as your price of redemption? If so, then you are now called to a new life and a new direction in that life. Our text verse today comes from 1 Peter, the first chapter, it's verses 13 through 16. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy holy. Following immediately after the Passover comes another feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unlike other feasts, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were given to Israel prior to their deliverance. What they picture in Christ Jesus was also given prior to the introduction of the New Covenant. Jesus instituted the New Covenant in his blood, becoming our Passover lamb, and he also imputed his righteousness to us his sinless perfection typified by the unleavened bread. Both of these were alluded to prior to his death. As we are granted his sinlessness in a positional way, isn't it right that we act that way in a manner in which we have called actually? Hopefully we will learn this lesson from the introduction of the feast of unleavened bread in today's passage. This and so many other wonderful pictures of Christ are there, and they're waiting for us to search them out from his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. Our first of three thoughts today is the blood shall be a sign. It's verses 12 and 13. Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. The Lord now promises that he will take the necessary action of this final plague in order to redeem Israel. Their long time of hard service and bondage is finally coming to an end, and in anticipation of that great moment, more instructions and details are now provided. The words, I will pass, are not given as a connection to the name Passover. They are a completely different word in the Hebrew, ve'abarti, which simply means to go through. There is a difference being made between Egypt and Israel. Passing through is meant in judgment. Passing over is meant in mercy. Further, it is the Lord who personally promises to perform this. It is not a designated representative such as a powerful angel, but rather it is the Lord who will act. The Bible notes elsewhere that salvation is of the Lord, but judgment is as well. 
Both of these actions at the Exodus prefigure the work of Jesus in the future. Verse 12 continues, And will strike all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Some years ago, I don't know if you remember him, Simcha Jacobovici, he's the naked archaeologist. He did a special on the plagues of Egypt. During his less than scholarly work, he found natural reasons for all of the plagues diminishing them to the point that God was left completely out of the picture. He gave several reasons for each plague and pulled a few sleight of hand maneuvers in the process. But the most egregious error that he made was concerning the plague on the firstborn. He claimed that the firstborn of Egypt lay on a cot that was lower than all the others as a sign of dignity. And because of this, natural gases crept in and killed all of the firstborn of Egypt because they alone slept on that honorable bed. First, there's no such proof of any such sleeping arrangements. And secondly, this verse says that the firstborn of both man and beasts were affected. Unless the Egyptians made little firstborn pig, monkey, donkey, cow, and goat beds that were lower than all the rest, we can be assured that the naked archaeologist is as full of hot air as his crummy theories. There is no possible natural explanation for what occurred on that terrible night of the first Passover. Having cleared that up in Exodus 4, this promise was first revealed to the ears of Moses. He said, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now the time for those words to be fulfilled has come. But... To make the plague all the more remarkable, it will include not only the firstborn of the people, but of all of the animals as well. The fifth plague was somewhat of a precursor to this coming plague. In chapter 9, a distinction was made between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt. It said there in verse 9-4, and the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Pharaoh failed to heed that remarkable occurrence and pressed on in his stubborn attitude. Now the final plague will be refined to such a precise extent that it will make the plague upon the livestock seem almost insignificant in comparison. Verse 12 going on, and against all the gods of Egypt. Now, although most of us in this room have read the Exodus account, including these few words here, we probably haven't lost any sleep over them. Let me read them again, and against all the gods of Egypt. But scholars vary in their opinion of what they mean, even to amazing degrees. The word gods can mean princes. It's translated that elsewhere in the Bible. And so some say that this means that they will equally suffer in the plague. In other words, against all the princes of Egypt. But that's obvious on the surface. Every household with the blood is exempted and every other will suffer. It could also mean that the term gods is explained by the firstborn of the people and the beasts. In other words, the firstborn of Pharaoh was considered the royal heir to the throne, and thus he was a deity. And all of the beasts that were worshipped would have their firstborn killed as well. Thus the judgment is against all the gods of Egypt in this sense. One person actually changes the spelling of the word gods into habitations, and so he would translate it and against all the habitations of Egypt. By reversing just one letter in the Hebrew, he comes up with this. Instead of the word Elohe, he changes it to Ale. But that kind of fiddling with the Bible is tenuous at best, and I would not recommend it to anybody here. Okay? Another possibility is that as the Lord went through Egypt, he destroyed all of their idols. This view is actually found elsewhere in the Bible. There's precedent there. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, we read this certain account about Dagon, the god of Ashdod. Here's what it says. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and uh, brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it before Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him up in his proper place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both of the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. 
Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Well, this is similar to the Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the Ark was stored in a wooden box with a Nazi symbol on it. Remember, it was on the cargo ship and the symbol was burned right off the box, just as Dagon was knocked off his perch. At least two other times, speaking of Egypt of the future, the Lord is said to literally destroy the idols of Egypt. Here it says in Isaiah 19:1, Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. And then in Jeremiah 43, 14, he says, He shall also break the sacred pillars of Beth Shemesh that are in the land of Egypt and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians he shall burn with fire. But all of these options fall short of being correct. What this probably means above all else is what one would expect and what they would assume when reading it without any presuppositions. In chapter 11, Moses told Pharaoh exactly what was coming by speaking these words to him. He said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. Knowing all of this in advance, and then seeing the onset of the plague, Pharaoh and all of Egypt would do what? They'd petition their false gods, but none would be able to save the firstborn. Thus, it would be a complete judgment on each and every god of Egypt in one fell swoop. They were entreated for mercy, but no mercy would come because they had no ears to hear and no power to stave off the plague. Because of this, the gods of Egypt are therefore judged as false gods. This then would be the same type of judgment as when the Lord accepted Elijah's offering on Mount Carmel, if you remember that story. The God of the worshipers of Baal was judged to be a false God before the Lord, exactly as the people acknowledged after seeing the Lord's fire coming down from heaven. Verse 12 going on, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. E'ese shefatim ani Yehovah. I, Yehovah, will execute judgment. It is emphatic that Yehovah would personally attend to the judgment on Egypt. He alone would work salvation and he alone would work destruction. To him alone belongs the power and the glory and to him alone belongs the fear of his enemies. So much for this squishy Christianity where Jesus loves everybody and is never going to judge anybody. Verse 13, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. What has to be understood is that Israel was not guilt free. We went through this many sermons ago. They had worshiped the idols of Egypt and they had not been faithful to their God. But the Lord had called Abraham and he made his promises to him. His plan of redemption for mankind was to come through this group of people, guilty as they may be. But the guilt implied that judgment was necessary. And so in order to atone for their sins, an innocent lamb was sacrificed. It is the blood which atones for sin and which expiates the guilt for the sins of the people. Those who had applied the blood would be exempt from judgment. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? If this isn't a clear enough picture of the work of the Lord Jesus and the mercy of God, then you might go back to the beginning and recheck your faith. Every detail of this account shows us pictures of what Christ, the Lamb of God, has done for us. Israel is being used as a microcosm of the greater salvation of all people of the world. We all stand guilty before God, and yet by applying faith in the shed blood of Christ to our lives, we are granted mercy and saved from the wrath to come. The doorposts for Israel, Calvary's cross for the world. The blood is the sign for the people of God. The sign is for us. It is not for God. He has provided the sign for our assurance of his following through with what the sign represents. Israel will be passed over. The church, hallelujah, is going to be raptured up. And both will be saved from the time of wrath which those around them would have to face. Verse 13 continues, And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Ufasachti alechem. The words are emphatic again. I will pass over you. Here, the spoken word is the guarantee. The Lord spoke a promise to Abraham, and Abraham believed. In that act of faith, the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. 
By faith, Israel was to keep the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. This is what Moses, who represented all of Israel, was noted for in Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of fame of faith. It says, by faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Likewise, God has given his word and our belief in what that word says is what counts us as righteous. The blood is the sign of the guarantee. The blood of the lamb in Egypt was the sign to the people. Our reception of the blood of Christ on Calvary's cross is our sign. When the Lord sees the blood, the Lord will pass over. God will not destroy those who are saved by the blood. It is a picture of our own redemption. Certainly a pre-tribulation rapture for the church and a complete protection for the sealed 144,000 of Israel during the tribulation period. Verse 13 continues, And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The word for plague here is negef. It is the first time that it's used in scripture and it means a mortal blow. The sense of the passage is that when the conditions laid down by the Lord were met, the privilege which he had extended to the people would be granted. If they failed to meet them, it would not be. Even among Israel, there was always a choice of obeying or disobeying. One way or another, Egypt would be struck, but Israel had been granted mercy. And so it's true with the world. Judgment is going to fall on all people. But for those who receive the word and accept the sign, mercy will come. Instead, our judgment came on Jesus Christ. That's the only difference. In judgment, I will pass through the land. I will destroy those who remain at war with me. In my anger, I will strike with my mighty hand a crushing blow for all the world to see. But there is also mercy for those who pay heed. I will not strike those who have faith in my word. When I see the blood, then it is agreed that I will extend mercy, even I, the Lord. Their judgment came in a substitute. An innocent lamb for them has died. My righteousness to them I will impute, for to their hearts the lamb's blood they have applied. Our second thought today is an everlasting ordinance, which is verses 14 through 16. Verse 14, so this day shall be to you a memorial. In these words comes the very first use of the word zikaron or memorial in the entire Bible. The feast which is now going to be explained was to be a constant reminder to the people of the redemption of Israel and all that it entailed. In order for it to be so, the Lord gives his instructions concerning this celebration. Verse 14 continuing, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Besides the Passover, this is the first mandated feast or Chag in the pages of the Bible. Previously, Moses demanded of Pharaoh that the Israelites would be allowed to go into the wilderness to observe a feast to the Lord. But that hasn't occurred yet, and it was not a mandated feast at that time. Rather, it was a request. This, however, is. From this time on, it was to be an annual reminder of the work of the Lord on their behalf and their responsibilities to him. All generations of Israelites after this were to observe this feast that they would never forget his acts on their behalf. Verse 14 going on, you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. The term everlasting ordinance is kukat olam tehagu. In essence, it is a feast which is to be observed forever and ever. This everlasting ordinance is not necessarily speaking of the Passover, but of the unleavened bread. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Matzot, as it says in Hebrew. The Passover is what makes the Feast of Unleavened Bread possible. So what I want you to do is I want you to think of Christ. Christ died on the cross. He is our Passover lamb, and that makes it possible for us to enter into his sinless perfection, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right? The Passover is one of the annual feasts of the Lord, and eventually these two, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, became united in terminology. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a separate and distinct celebration with its own picture and its own fulfillment in Christ and in his church. Verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. The Passover is on the 14th of the month. This feast is held from the 15th to the 21st day of the month. A seven-day week is believed to have been completely unknown to Egypt at this time, but it was not completely unknown to the world. 
Abraham's family observed a seven-day week as was seen in the marriage of Jacob to Leah. Jacob was asked to fulfill his marriage week before marrying Rachel. Despite this, there is no record of Israel observing a seven-day week until this point right here. From here on out, it would be the standard observance of the people. Whatever day of the week the 15th fell on, they were required to remove all of the leaven from their houses and to keep it out for a full week. During this time, they were to eat unleavened bread. Now, I interviewed a uh, Jewish guy here in Sarasota many years ago for uh, when I was going to a Southern Evangelical Seminary there. They asked me to interview somebody in another religion. And so I interviewed a Holocaust survivor, and uh, he brought this up about taking the leaven out during his week of uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he said, well, what we do is we take all the bread and we put it in the freezer, and we leave it there until the uh, week is over, and then we take it out. So they're cheating nowadays, okay? They're supposed to take it out completely and not have any at all in there. It's, but, you know, that's just the way that we get in, in our, uh, our, our faith and our practice when we get away from the Word of God. The reason that this leaven was to be taken out is it pictured the complete removal of the yeast of Egypt from their bread. In the Bible, bread is the fundamental means of sustaining the Bible. It's even a symbol of life itself. If one didn't remove the yeast of Egypt, it showed that they longed after that which Egypt provided. In essence, they had failed to separate themselves from the life that they were called to leave. The removal of Egyptian yeast thus symbolized their new life, being purified from their old means of sustaining life. Putting it in a freezer doesn't work. In general, yeast can be considered in one of two ways. First, it causes fermentation and thus corruption. But it also causes the bread to rise, which pictures pride, which is in itself a form of corruption. The remembrance of the feast is given for the reason of severing themselves from the wicked practices of Egypt. However, the picture is given for us to see Jesus and his perfection, as well as our obligation to act in a pure and undefiled manner. This is explicitly stated by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Corinthians were having issues with immorality in the church, and so Paul wrote to them words of correction. In his words, he identifies both the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Here's what he says. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, there's the fulfillment of that feast, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, now he gets into the second feast. Let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. First, he noted that Christ is our Passover. After this, he notes that we are to keep the feast. It is not the Passover, but the feast of unleavened bread of which he speaks. Again, keep reminding yourself of Christ's work. He died on a cross. That is the Passover. We accept him and we enter into him and that is our time of unleavened bread we're supposed to get rid of the wickedness that we once bore when we lived in the world everything follows a pattern in the bible we have been called out of spiritual egypt meaning the fallen world if we don't remove the yeast of egypt meaning the old immoral ways of the world it shows that we still long after that which the world provides rather than what christ has offered as always, every single word that we are seeing in the Old Testament is pointing to a much larger picture in redemptive history. Verse 15 continues, For whoever eats unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. The penalty for eating bread with yeast was for that person to be cut off from Israel. This seems like a very harsh penalty, especially when it was mere observance of something that happened only once in their history. However, it is a picture of a greater truth which is explained again by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What is it that we are to do with those who transgress the commands of the Bible in the church age? The answer is found in what Paul recommends for that man who is living in sexual immoral, immorality there in Corinth. He says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Just like the Israelites of old, we are to expel the man who is living in malice and in wickedness. And Paul gives the exact reason why we are to treat a fellow Christian in this manner in Galatians chapter 5. Here's what he says. 
a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If yeast were allowed in the house of Israel, it would be used as yeast is used for leavening the bread. Thus, all of the bread would be leavened. If sin is allowed into the church, it is bound to affect the entire congregation. It is a lesson in our modern church which is completely forgotten and how quickly we have degraded into the vilest of conduct in once faithful denominations, right? That's what we're being taught by this feast right here. Verse 16, on the first day there shall be a holy convocation and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. A holy convocation or mikra kodesh is called for both the 15th of the month and the 21st of the month. It was to be a gathering of the people for sacrifice, prayer, and fellowship. It may have also included instruction as well, you know, the priest telling the people what to do. Later, these convocations were called by the blowing of the silver trumpets, which were directed by the Lord to be made for this very purpose. Verse 16 continues, no manner of work shall be done on them. This is explained in more detail in Leviticus 23, verses seven and eight. It says, on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. Customary work means employment or regular work. This then is not, and this is important to understand, this is not a Sabbath observance which forbid work of any kind, including the cooking of meals. And that's seen as we continue right now, verse 16 going on. But that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. Food could be prepared on this particular day of convocation. And thus, this is not a Sabbath. And this is important to know and remember concerning the timeline of Jesus' cross. The Gospels are very, very clear that the following day after Christ's cross was a Sabbath, not a convocation. And that's why people get so theologically confused about the Passion Week of Jesus Christ is because they don't study this Old Testament terminology. This is recorded in Luke 23. Here's what it says. Then he took it down, meaning the body of Jesus, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of a rock where no one had ever been laid before. That day was the preparation day and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid then they returned and paired, prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Therefore, understanding the terminology right here in the verse that we're looking at, and that of the Gospels, we can know with all assurances that Christ's cross occurred on a Friday, not on a Wednesday, and not on a Thursday, all right? As a memorial and as an everlasting ordinance, you shall leave behind the life you once held dear. To you, there is now to be a new allegiance and in your life shall a new lifestyle appear. For those who are unwilling to comply with my word, you shall hand them over to Satan as is their choice. This is for their good, so that on the day of the Lord, their spirit will be saved according to my voice. I have spoken that all who come to me will be saved, but the congregation needs to be kept pure and holy. And so for those who have willingly misbehaved, they must in this life suffer their own indignity. Our third thought. Let us keep the feast, verses 17 through 20. Verse 17, so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. To us, the words translated this same day would be a very unusual expression. They are be'etzem hayom, in the bone of the day. The meaning is that of the same substance. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter two, where Adam said these words, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me. Adam was declaring the woman to be of the same substance or bone as he. Thus to say the bone of the day is to mean the day of the same substance as the original. Each year on the same day, the 15th of the first month, the feast is to be commemorated. It's a very interesting idiom that unfortunately didn't make it into our English language like so many others did. It is on this same day that the Lord says that he will have brought out Israel's army. It is the third time now in the Bible that the word sabah or armies is applied to the people of Israel. The Lord is their commander and they are his hosts. 
When they leave, it will not be as a ragtag bunch of people, but as an army bearing dignity and order. Verse 17 going on, Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. Again, they're reminded that this day is to be observed. The repetition has purpose. It is to show that they are to pay special heed to the instruction and never fail to follow through with it. The Exodus itself began on this day, the 15th of the month. This corresponds to our new life in Christ coming after our judgment on sin and our deliverance from it. Remember the cross. Remember what happens afterward. Everything is in a logical order. In essence, there is the day of our adoption, which is immediately followed by our journey in the Lord as his adopted. We will never become unadopted, and so we are to conduct ourselves as if this were truly the case. Verse 18, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Okay, in the Hebrew, the word month is missing at the beginning of this verse. It literally says in the first on the 14th day. Okay, I want you to know that this is not an unusual form of ellipsis. When something is otherwise understood, it's often dropped. Because the word is used two more times in this single verse, it is to be understood that it is the first of the month. And I say that because a lot of the times in the Bible, you'll see the month mentioned and it doesn't give the day. It implies that it's the first of the month. So as you're reading the Bible, if you've got questions about that, this verse will answer that for you. This here is a general repeat of verse 15. And it is a reminder that if a person were to eat bread with yeast in it during this period, it would in essence be a denial of the new life in which they were called to live. The generations afterward were to follow suit as a reminder of this calling. The entire seven day period was made holy through the special observances of the first and the seventh days of the feast. These mikra kodeshim or holy convocations sanctified the entire period. They therefore, the first day and the seventh day, stand in place of all seven days. This observance then is realized in our life in Christ. The eating of the unleavened bread pictures our own pursuit of Christ in this new life. His words in John 6, 27 point to this. He said this, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. The giving up of regular work is then picturing our having attained true rest in him. This is seen in Hebrews 4, 3, where it says that we who have believed enter into his rest. We talked about that last week. Got some friends that are Sabbatarians or they're Seventh-day Adventists, and they want to be able to give verses to show that we don't observe a Sabbath day. That's a verse right there, Hebrews 4, 3. And then a few verses later, the author of Hebrews explains it further. He says, for he who has entered his rest, meaning you and me entering into the rest of Christ, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. We are in our rest. That's why we don't have a Sabbath day. In Christ, our labors are finished, symbolized by the convocations at the beginning and at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, these two days stand in place of the entire feast. No Sabbath day, we have a day of worship. We come together on the Lord's Day. It's an important point to remember. You don't get distracted by things like Sabbath day worships. Verse 19, for seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. Again, this verse appears to be just a mere repetition of what's already been said, but it is not. An addition is made, which is that there is a distinction between a native born and a stranger in the land. The native of the land in Hebrew is called etzrach ha'aretz, or literally, if you translate it literally, a tree in its native soil. The stranger is the word ger, which is a foreigner or an alien. The distinction between the two is important. The native is speaking of a literal descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land was promised to them, and they are considered of the native soil. So they're a tree in its native soil. The stranger is anyone who has joined themselves to Israel and accepted their customs and practices. 
And this here has enormous ramifications, both at the Exodus, where an immense multitude of foreigners joined Israel and became a part of the collective whole, as well as numerous incidents throughout the Bible of people coming into Israel. It also includes those non-Israelites who have joined Israel today. They are collectively under the same umbrella. And the same is true with those who will live in the land after the tribulation period. Here's what Ezekiel says about these people. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourself. And for the strangers, meaning the people that are not native, who dwell among you and who bear children among you, they shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Hugely important to explain why this great number of people is recorded after the Exodus, 603,550 people. How can it be that there's that many people when there were 75 or whatever, 70 that went down to Egypt with Jacob? That answers it right there. God has made a provision for the stranger in the land of Israel. Those who are joined to Israel bear the same responsibilities and they are to share in the same opportunities. This hasn't changed even in modern times with Israel and it is the exact expectation of the church. All are considered on an equal basis in Christ. Paul explains this in Ephesians chapter two. Here's what he says. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, at that time, meaning all of us, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is why he uses the imagery of the olive tree in Romans 9 through 11. There is the native tree and there is the wild olive. The same conditions are levied upon both and the same honors are granted to both. Thank Jesus Christ for his mercy upon us Gentiles, right? Verse 20, our final verse of the day, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. These words extend the meaning of what was said about the bread. Not only are they to eat unleavened bread, but they are to eat nothing with leaven in it. No food of any kind was to have any form of yeast in it. Further, this prohibition is to go to any dwelling where they reside. This includes their time in the wilderness, in Canaan, and even during their exiles around the world. So I'd like to tell those old people, those old Holocaust survivors, get the leaven out of your house. You're not fulfilling the picture of Christ very well. But obviously they're not because they've never called on Jesus. But they were required to observe this at the same time each year, year after year, wherever they lived. Having said that, because this feast is fulfilled in Christ, it is also set aside in Christ, as are all of the feasts of the Lord. Jesus Christ has accomplished everything which was pictured by the Old Testament system and every law required by that system. In him alone is found the perfection of God's standard. Now, instead of observing these feasts, we trust in their fulfillment in Christ. I got to tell you what, this is a hugely important issue because there are churches all over that mandate, like I said, a Sabbath day worship or this feast or that feast. Or some people say that the fall feasts haven't yet been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the rapture is going to happen on one of those days. All of that is not true. It's a heresy to say that because he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament system. If he didn't die as our atoning sacrifice, thus fulfilling the uh, day of atonement, then we are still in our sins. Do you see the importance of this? Jesus Christ has fulfilled all of the system. He is the embodiment of the law. People get this wrong and they get off on all of these theological tangents when it's so simple. Christ is our fulfillment. We are in him. We don't do these things. End of that story. Paul explains this several times and in several ways in the New Testament, but he is exceptionally clear about this in the book of Colossians. Here's what he says. And people will listen to this and they'll say, well, that doesn't say what it says. Here's what it says. So let no one judge you in food or drink, meaning the Old Testament dietary system, or regarding a festival, any of these feasts, the seven or eight feasts of the Lord, or a new moon, which is every month they had to have, or a Sabbath, Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. Christ fulfilled everything so that we don't have to. Are we saved by works or are we saved by grace? Anybody? Grace. If we have to do these things, then we're not saved by grace. And thus, what Christ did on that cross was insufficient. And we have no hope in this world. 
That's how absolutely important the seemingly unimportant set of verses that we're looking at today is. God is giving us lessons about the work of his son for you and me. A guy like me, you wonder why I love Jesus so much? Just know what he forgave me of. Israel's laws concerning the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread symbolize their deliverance from Egypt and consecration based on redemption. Those shadows are now fulfilled in Christ. And so let us keep the feast in him, not with externals, but with the internal changes which he desires from his people. Don't worry about unleavened bread celebrations during the year. Worry about getting rid of the sin in your life. That's the picture that we're supposed to have. Now we've come to the end of today's verses, but not the end of this story. Much wonder lies ahead and all of it pictures a greater story, that of Jesus. It is through him that true deliverance from this corrupt world comes about. And it is through him that heaven's doors are once again wide open for the people of the world. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would ask that you please just give me another moment to explain how you can today. God sent his son into this world to fulfill this giant body of law, which is his standard. We, if we fail on one precept of that law, according to James, we've broken the whole law. It's a law. It's a unified body. So if we told a lie, we might, have, might as well have murdered somebody. It doesn't make any difference. The law is broken. And it is impossible for anyone to fulfill that law. It is not possible. God gave us that law to show us that. And all of the Old Testament shows us failure, failure, failure. I think it was this morning's prayer on, on uh, Facebook. The whole body of law says, we fail, Jesus prevails. He came without original sin. He lived that law perfectly. And he gave that beautiful life up in exchange for your sin. I'm giving the greatest treasure in the world away for absolute filth just so that you can be reconciled to me. That's how much I love you. And he gave that life up and he died to take away our sin. And our sin is nailed to that cross. It dies with him. And then in comes a new covenant. And here we have the starting of it right here in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Live holy because you are holy. I have sanctified you. Now prove it to the world by acting in this manner. Stop doing the wicked things you're doing. But first, call on Jesus and be saved. That's the first thing to do. And he will give you the grace to live holy. All right? That is the lesson we can learn today. Call on Jesus. Be saved. God loves you that much. Our closing verse today is from Ephesians chapter 4. It's verses 21 through 24. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Feast of Unleavened Bread, right there in Ephesians, people. Wonderful stuff from a great God. Next week is Exodus 12. It's 21 through 28. It's entitled, What Do You Mean by This Service? That'll be our 34th Exodus sermon. I'll tell you this. I tell you this every week, and every week we get closer to that monumentous event, and I get more excited about it. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Even if a deep ocean lies ahead of you, he can part the waters, and he can lead you through it on dry ground. So follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. All right? Short poem, and we'll be done. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you have the New King James Version, read along and it'll follow almost exactly. I don't change this very much. It says, For I will pass through the land on Egypt on that night, and I will strike in the land of Egypt all the firstborn. Both man and beast will face this plight, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment as I have sworn. I am the Lord. This is my spoken word. Now the blood shall be for you a sign on the houses where you stay. And when I see the blood by my design, I will pass over you and not come by your way. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt as I am set to do. So this day shall be a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast. To the Lord throughout your generations, you shall keep it from the greatest to the least. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, just as I have said. For whoever eats unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Thus I have commanded you in this way. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you too. 
No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which every one must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread as I instructed you. For on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, as promised to you. Therefore you shall observe this day in your governance throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Remember to do as I have said. For seven days no leaven shall be found in the houses of your nation, since whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from Israel's congregation. Whether he is a stranger or a native of the land, this is what to you I now command. You shall eat nothing leavened, but instead, in all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. These are the instructions as given by the Lord for Israel's feast as he commanded them to do. And so by his spoken word, they were so charged with his words to carry through. But this feast is only a picture, a mere shadow of the greater work of the Lord Jesus. In what he has done, we have come to know the fullness of what God has done for us. And so let us keep the feast in sincerity. Let us devote our lives to holy living in his sight. We as the Lord's redeemed have been called to purity and to conduct ourselves in a manner just and right. And so let it be according to his word that we live this way for all of our days, pursuing Christ in Christ alone, our precious Lord, and giving to God through him all of our praise. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is to read these passages which we just brush through so quickly, not really realizing their significance until we get down to the details, the minute words which are so poignantly pointing to Jesus Christ our Lord. Every single detail picked out by you to show us him in your heart for us. What a God, what a great God that you could do this and help us to pursue this wonderful superior word all the days of our life. Help us never to treat it with anything but absolute reverence and holiness and to exalt you with our lives, to magnify you wherever we go and to pull people out of the fire before the day of destruction comes. Help us to do that. We love you. We praise you. We exalt you. Be with your people, O oh God, and be with us during your Lord's table. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 11, these wonderful words, which is exactly, exactly what we have been talking about today. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks over it. He would have said these words, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. And he broke it. Oh, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe brings forth bread from the earth and he broke it and he said take and eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after supper and he would have blessed us as well he would have said Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech haolam borei peri hagafen blessed art thou O Lord our God king of the universe creator of the fruit of the vine this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. In the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, how good you are to us. Thank you for this Lord's table we can come to each and every week and reflect on you and what you did, and reflect on the fact that you really are coming again. The sign wasn't given to Israel for you. The sign was given to Israel for them, for the assurance of what they already had. And Lord... You've given us the sign. It's a sure going to happen as the ground under our feet. You are coming for your people, and all we will do is just wait until that glorious day, whenever it may be, and may be soon. We love you and we praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.